Welcome to Nuked Radio. This is episode 92. Today is Thursday, February the 7th, 2013. I'm your host, Christina Consolo, and with me today is Noki Travers from radwatch.info, and Kurt from Room 101 is also here to help us play a clip. Hi, guys. Good hey. afternoon, Christina. Kurt, did you hear about Jules' TSA adventure on her flight down? Uh, briefly, I, I did hear that she uh, had a, had a little encounter with him, but I didn't hear the whole uh, full details of the story. Well, I I plan on having her like fill us in in the way only Jules can when she tells a story. But I guess they detected explosive residue on her luggage, <laughs> so she got a major groping. Had to go into like two different rooms with two different people and ha- answer all these questions. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you didn't tell me you're on a show called Nuked Radio, did you? <laughs> but uh, I got to. All you uh, need to do is walk on the grass after it's been fertilized, and the fertilizer will set off those. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if she went through one of those air blowers, if they still do that, but. Um, she thought it might have been from, like, a Target shooting that she went to a couple of years ago, and she had a vest in her bag that she wore to this um, Target shooting. But anyway, we'll get the details from her when she gets back. Um, today, the great shakeout of the New Madrid was held at 10.15 this morning. And as you guys probably know from watching the Earth Changes, on Tuesday night we had an 8.0 with a number of subsequent large earthquakes at the Santa Cruz Islands, which are just a little bit northeast of Australia. Michio Kaku was on CBS yesterday with some pretty scary earthquake information. So we're going to take a listen to what he had to say on that program. The 2.80 earthquake that struck the South Pacific last night. Experts were surprised by the massive quakes that hit Indonesia in 2004 and Japan in 2011. Now, a new prediction model could change the thinking behind so-called superquakes. Physics professor Ichio Kaku of City University of New York is here. Welcome. Welcome. Mm -hmm. So what is the new model and how significant is it? Well, this affects the 9.0 monster earthquake that has a thousand times more energy than what rocked the Solomon Islands just yesterday. We're talking about the 800-pound gorilla of earthquakes. And we now realize that by rights they shouldn't exist. When a small earthquake takes place, it dissipates the energy. So we shouldn't have 9.0s, which, which devastated Fukushima. By rights they shouldn't exist. But now we realize that a fault line could be like a battery accumulating energy across many cycles, and this is a game changer. It means that we may have to rewrite all the textbooks on earthquakes. So you're saying we could predict these? No, it means that it's even more unpredictable because it means that even an innocent fault off the coast of Fukushima can sustain a 9.0 monster quake when by rights there should not be a 9.0. So it means that in some sense we're back to the dark ages, uh, realizing that even on off, coast, off the coast of the United States, even an innocent fault may sustain the monster 9.0. Based on this new theory, could any of these superquakes occur in the United States? One possibility is the Cascadia Fault off the coast of Seattle, Portland, and the Pacific Northwest. It sustained monster earthquakes before, and it means that they could be unpredictable, building up energy even when we don't know that there's a battery there storing the energy about to be released on the Pacific Northwest. Also, the signing of nuclear power plants. It means that if a nuclear power plant is near a fault line, and the fault line seems to be innocent, mm-hmm. it could actually be storing up energy over many cycles. I thought you were going to come here and make us feel better about earthquakes. <laughs> well, it's humbling realizing that Mother Nature has a lot of tricks up her sleeve, yeah. and we're just beginning to tease apart the, how the mechanics of earthquakes. But earthquake prediction, unfortunately, is still hocus-pocus. Uh, the 8.0 magnitude earthquake off the Solomon Islands set off a tsunami. We have an animation of tsunami following. Uh, how do you know when a tsunami is going to form? Well, we're not positive, but we think that when you have a subduction fault, that is one fault slips underneath the other fault, mm-hmm. it means that part of the, the seafloor falls, the other part rises, and the mismatch causes the sea levels to rise a few feet. That doesn't sound like much, a few feet. However, it's spread out over hundreds of miles. The energy is so great that it actually affects the orbit of the Earth around the sun. 
It actually affects how many seconds there are in a given day. It actually affects the geometry of the planet Earth itself. And if you had to look anywhere in the world and try and predict where there might be another magna earthquake or super earthquake, as you call them, where are you most concerned about? Well, we are worried about perhaps a Tokyo earthquake because the Fukushima fault is actually disconnected from the fault near Tokyo. Also, we have to worry about Tehran. And of course, we have to worry about San Francisco, Los Angeles. Uh, we have to realize that the ground under your feet is not as stable as you think it is. Professor Haku, thank you. Thanks for playing that clip, Kurt. But anytime you hear Michio Kaku say something's a game changer and textbooks need to be rewritten, um, pay attention. The only thing I didn't agree with, what he said was that earthquake prediction is still hocus pocus. That's actually not true when you consider radon outgassing that's measured before large quakes. And Noki and I are going to talk about that a little bit later too. The earthquake drill that was held this morning was for the states of Oklahoma, Arkansas, Kentucky, Tennessee, Illinois, and Missouri. And let's see here, they had 2.4 million people altogether registered to be in this event. I dropped a link into chat. There's a couple of uh, PDF downloads on the official ShakeOut site that you might be interested in reading. Something else that we have followed closely are the boom events and how they relate to earthquakes and how it may tie in with the rad levels and radon. We're going to be doing an upcoming show on earth change stuff with the United Knowledge and also with the Jumping Jack Flash guy. He's agreed to come on Nuked Radio and talk to us and I guess he's never done <clears throat> an interview before so I'm really excited to talk to him and I'm hoping to do that as early as this weekend. Now, later on in the show, we're going to uh, take callers. If you want to ask Noki what the rad numbers have been in your part of the country, and he can impart his own brand of Buddhist wisdom about your location as well. On Tuesday, also, if you guys missed it, we interviewed Paul Garner, who's an environmental law attorney who filed a suit against TEPCO on behalf of all the U.S. servicemen and women from the Marines, Air Force, and the Navy who are now coming down with very, very serious illness after participating in Operation Tomodachi following the 9.0 earthquake, bringing 17 tons of food, blankets, and water and other very needed supplies to people that were affected by the earthquake and tsunami but they were not informed by TEPCO of the extent of the Fukushima disaster. And I will be uploading that interview later on today. I've had a problem using images from the Operation Tomodachi because most of them have been copyrighted by the U.S. military. So I'm hoping to find a way to get around that later today because otherwise it's all ready to be uploaded. It was an awesome interview. And Paul really gives me a lot of hope. I've had a couple of extensive conversations with him. In fact, we talked for about two hours after the show on Tuesday. And he is really, really dedicated to this. He's doing this out of his own pocket. He said with what he's learned from investigating this case, he doesn't think he can ever really focus on anything else. Like, he's he's really in this for the long haul, and he's doing so many things at once, putting together a website and a registry so new people can get information. I mean, he even gave out his cell phone number on the show for people who might have been involved in that operation and, and maybe uh, retired or, or left the service and aren't aware and just are finding out now that this is going on with their comrades. And he, he was really funny. He calls me a Fukushima expert, which I guess I am as far as alternative radio goes. But we kind of joked around about that. And, you know, I told him there's thousands of us. And really the only people that know more about the Fukushima disaster is TEPCO. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, you know, with all the different facets of this disaster that we know about, you know, he, he's going right to the source and, and 
putting a case together for the people that were in the front line. And any kind of litigation that might spin off from that, that might come later, remains to be seen. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people watching this case very closely. And I think he really needs to be careful, too, because he's going up against this billion-dollar industry. The information that he has so far is extremely damaging. And we're going to cover that legal case in as much detail as possible. If this does go to court, if this does go to trial, I plan on going and reporting from the trial. A report that came out today on any news. Japan expert reveals Fukushima cover-up investigation blocked into whether Reactor 1 was damaged by quake and not tsunami. And this was something Paul and I talked about after the show, too. You know, there's a, a video of the plant that shows after the earthquake, smoke is pouring out of Reactor 1 before the tsunami even hits. No, Noki, have you seen that video? Um, I, I've seen them all. Christine. Yeah, I'll I have it queued up because I needed and, to send uh, it to Paul, so um, I'll I'll drop it into chat a little bit later. This article came out actually in several different publications today. TEPCO blocked an attempt by a diet appointed panel to enter the number one reactor building at the Fukushima Daiichi complex for an accident investigation last year, saying the unit was in complete darkness which was not true, a member of the panel said, on Thursday. The panel members were seeking to determine whether important equipment of the number one reactor had suffered damage as a result of the earthquake on March 11th before ensuing, ensuing tsunami ravaged the plant. In a report compiled in July last year, the panel said the earthquake may have damaged equipment necessary for ensuring the safety at the number one reactor, touching on the possibility of small-scale pipe breaks, it also said that several workers who were on the fourth floor of the number one reactor building at the time of the earthquake witnessed water leaks on the same floor, which houses two large tanks for the isolation condenser and piping for the condenser. And there's a number of Fukushima experts right now that have been going through the common spent fuel pool building photographs. I don't want to mention their names on here because I don't want them to get a lot of undue attention. They're doing a just fantastic job of compiling data, going through images. If any of you guys are on my page, you probably know who these people are. And we're getting a lot of attention now. In fact, since I had Paul on the show, I have a LinkedIn profile, and I had like five people from Sandia Labs looking at my profile in the last two days. So, I mean, they're, they know that we're exposing a lot of the stuff that's going on, and this fallout will reach the U.S. government eventually. Something that Noki and I... Some fallout. <laughs> yeah. Something Noki and I had been talk to, talking about, too, is a lot of people that we know that are in this movement and have been following this story are, are really depressed. I guess you would say, about just the lack of attention, the difficulty trying to get mainstream media to cover any of this stuff. New York Times once in a while will publish something. Wall Street Journal will now because of this lawsuit. I think we're going to get a lot of exposure. But, I mean, I'm really, really hopeful, especially after talking to Paul, that this is, is going to go mainstream. And... A lot of people following this, they get overwhelmed by all the facets of the disaster. And, you know, eventually you kind of find your niche. Just for an example, I have a friend on YouTube named Warning616 who lived in the Pacific Northwest and she moved to um, Idaho because of some of the rad levels that were going on. I think she's now gone back to the coast and she's been reporting exclusively on tsunami debris. You know, that's kind of now her area of expertise. So whenever I want to find out what's going on, I, I message her, and she gives me an update. Patrick Penry, who we were hoping to have on the show today, did a wonderful job breaking down the NRC Freedom of Information Act documents. And I don't know what how many videos ended up being in that series. He did. He was planning on doing just five Eight. days. 
and I think it went over into the next week. I have his um, videos queued up because I need to listen to all of them. And so that's kind of now his specialty. You know, Miss Milky the Clown, who's been at this from day one with her daily news. Kevin Blanche, you know, nobody does a rant yeah, better than Kevin Blanche. In fact, you were thinking about getting a tattoo for him, Milky? <laughs> No, oh uh, no, no. Here, it's funny because the last time I spoke to a federal law enforcement officer about the nature of my tattoos as I was being interviewed, um, I told them that they wanted to know if my tattoos were gang related, and I said, "Well, actually, this is about a twenty-five hundred-year-old gang," and. Uh, you know, it, they're Buddhist tattoos, and, you know, so the, our, our thing is do no harm, okay? Right. We pick, I pick ants up and flies and let them, I walk them to the front door of the house and uh, release them. We don't ever swat anything around here. It's catch and release, but... Uh, you know, Christina, um, it's amazing how the links just cross all the barriers and borders that all these countries set up. This is a Fukushima showed everyone. We thought there was a heart in there. Mm -hmm. Of course these governments are going to be forthcoming. Of course the, the best experts and fire jumpers on the planet are going to get on top of this. The Russians blew up there. They didn't even have a containment on this thing. And they, in looking back at it, and it was the worst disaster ever, they did a, a better job than TEPCO's doing at all. And if you, Two years? Come on. If you study... The Chernobyl disaster too. There were a couple of oh, yeah. very high-profile people that ended up like committing suicide. The the guy. Well, you know, remember, and the, I can't those, remember what the gentleman's the, name was. He was like the the leader of the liquidators. The World Health Organization will tell you like 92 people died from Chernobyl, or 371. Or they were firemen. And then uh, there's two camps in the nuclear information world. They, just like there's two camps in the economics of what's happening in our country right now, and politically. So there's, we don't seem to be able to control and affect these people. The fact that they, the TEPCO would burn the U.S. to armed forces is a pretty serious matter, especially when they've got the NRC on the phone. Uh -huh. And I, you know, obviously it was a big foobar because, you know, T Tepco's first thought wasn't how do we protect everybody. It was, well, are we going to be able to save these reactors or are we going to have to scrap them? That was their first big decision. And, you know, uh, and the helicopter uh, mechanic was the metaphor for the whole thing. For me. Yeah. I thought he did a wonderful job. Uh, that and, and the be this beautiful country with the exquisite depth to their culture actually has, all, has been in the hands of the criminal organizations of the world for a long time. The triads, the Yakuza, uh, there's nothing that really happens over there that doesn't have a chain effect. And uh, the reason that uh, the, the nuclear thing isn't together is because the politicians and the military, instead of trying to do this safely, they put pressure on the scientists and engineers to hurry up and get this stuff going because the costs are so enormous. Uh -huh. You know, in Mitsubishi, this is the, my other metaphor, this corporation that hot rod, that nobody told us they were going to start hot rodding the, the steam turbines and that Mitsubishi, uh, you know, and General Electric and Hitachi and, you know, these are all one big company right now. 
Well, and if there's any nuke... place you shouldn't be cutting corners in safety, it's a nuke plant. But even but with it, it, the everything... military, it's an, because it's a matter of our national security, it's no different than the drone unfolding right now or the surveillance of Americans right now. If you're an organic farmer, you're, you're a likely terrorist suspect. And I, I can't for the understand, you know, that at the Super Bowl, we blessed, God blessed us with a farmer. But the farmer, his plight is known better than the indigenous Native Americans or the, or the people, right, the indigenous people in Canada who are being literally bulldozed right now. There, these, there's you. Youngsters are standing in the path of heavy earth-moving equipment and shutting down trains. And the fact is that there is no disclosure. And we haven't heard from anybody in our government. And they're trying to tell us that we, we just have a lot of radon here in America. Well, I, there's a lot of radon coming out of Fukushima. Yeah, it's, it's like a radon volcano, basically. Exactly. I mean, uh, when they started injecting nitrogen into the reactors to keep the hydrogen levels down, I'm like, oh, well, that sounds good, but actually they're blowing all this radioactive hydrogen out of the, out of the containment all day long. Where do you think it's going to go? It's going to go in the atmosphere. They don't have to clean that mess up. Nobody even knows about how much shit's been blown out with these nitrogen injections. It puts it directly into our atmosphere. And the Earth's not that big a place anymore. There's so much activity. Yeah, I have so. a, an article up, too, because, um, you know, it's important that people remember, this was reported on a Japan TV, that the Fukushima radioactive plume is circling the earth and every 40 days they're measuring major fallout spikes in Japan and that's in addition to all the well, we're measuring that are waves in Seattle that we've never seen I've been watching for a year and a half and uh, I got a big one back in January 23rd and ever since then and just around the Kauai started acting up we started getting these outrageous readings for months and when, if you're a civilian Geiger runner on this network, you, and you're an alarming for months, they want to hear from you. We want to try to corroborate this. Is your equipment working? So, I mean... We need to we, get a we, lot we, more people we can't, I can't trust the EPA to operate their federal facility. But... Uh, you know, we did get a bunch of readings, and then uh, Sitka got a spike and a bump last night. So the stuff's flying around. There's no doubt about it. And the jet stream is your fire hose blowing this stuff. And no one's holding the end of the, the fire hose, so it, it goes back and forth and back and forth. Yeah, we got two main routes across this country, north and the southern. We see it blow down in across Canada, Alaska, through the Pacific Northwest, across Montana and Idaho, right on into Minnesota, hits the Great Lakes, boom. A whole bunch of stuff stops right there. Southern California comes across, you got... Las Vegas, all the way down through Arizona, then big winds out in Texas. I got North Texas and Ponca, Oklahoma, running high numbers all the time. Well, then you get on over to the East Coast, right over like to Savannah River, Georgia. All right, so yeah. I can draw lines. And we don't, it's a field day for everybody in the industry because of the Fook thing. Everybody can do whatever they want, and we don't know who's doing anything. So it's a good time to take advantage of the distraction. It must be that Fukushima fallout. Well, it might be your local nuke plant doing a little off-gassing. It could be or, that. It could be radon outgassing from faults. 
and and That's I've right. talked about that on the show a couple of times, and we had a really interesting example that happened about 10 days ago. You had sent me a couple of graphs that um, that had some pretty big spikes, first in Alabama and then in Arkansas, but they were within right, an right. hour of each other. Yeah, that's the southern flyway, yep. Yeah, and, and I said, let's watch and see what happens with earthquakes in this area right now. Right. They're, they're having quite a few in Arkansas. And five days later, we hit, uh, we had, um, it was the day that we had early to it on, in fact. And there was a lot of evidence that that was a radon event. And uh, there's a lot of hot springs in Arkansas. There's a lot of thermal magma activity under there. But you might as well draw a huge circle around there because of our seismic Madrids, because of our sinkholes, because of uh, how we've lost the protection outer islands around New Orleans. That whole, uh, uh, you know, that's getting liquefacted over there faster. That, there's has nobody really. It's another boondoggle. There's there's no definitive scientific spot on point. It's like somebody telling us what's happening down there. No, he and who's not? And what's belching out of the ground? All kinds of stuff. But it, it reads up too. Apparently, just since apparently we had, it's got some radionuclides coming with it. Just since we had early on, there's been a couple of reports that have come out about massive methane releases too. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. Uh, Debbie Your house blows asking, up. <laughs> you know, little De things. Debbie is asking in chat, has anyone noticed that on Radiation Network you can see CPM for the US, Europe, Australia, South America, etc., but not Canada? Right. Why is that? Well, you could if somebody up in Canada bought a Geiger counter and a seat at the table for about $600 is what it takes to play on the radiation network. Thanks. You get your you get yourself an inspector or if you really want right now there's a comparable model the, the Mazer PRM 9000. It's a really nice tool. And how how much you can does plug that this run? into your you plug it into your computer and now you are able to detect these what I consider are gamma events happening in the atmosphere going over your house. So this, this cloud that you can't see, and it doesn't make any noise, even though there might, it might be having some electrical interaction with the ground, there's uh, some evidence that there's a kind of like radioactive lightning exchanges. Uh -huh. And then you've, if you look... Also, go to NOAA's vapor conuses, west and east coast, and your jet stream, and you'll see these troughs develop in the cold air. So we get these fallout points all of a sudden and get dumped in an area. And I believe these are fallout events. Okay. Not, I think those are, are more indicative of a fallout event. And... Uh, the stuff's always morphing and changing into something else, and the sunlight affects it, and the time of day. So what I tried, to, you know, it, my thing started with people calling me and saying, hey, um, what's it like in my area? Because we know you can look at the trends and see. Now, there's two main networks in this uh, commercially available right now. One of them is called Black Cat. Mm -hmm. And I like their setup, but they chose to go with the wrong meters. You need to have a pancake meat style Geiger tube, or better these days. The day of the cylinders, they, if you walk into an area that's 10,000 CPM, it's good to have a small tube. You, you keep, it keeps the noise level down. You can get real accurate readings. But we want to do the opposite. I'm like SETI. I'm like listening as carefully as I can for anything coming across. Uh -huh. And we catch them every night, this spike in Sitka. That's a, 
that is a probably a heavy kind of gamma event passing over this guy's Geiger counter, and it's putting a signal on it for a little bit, and that kind of stuff used to be way more infrequent. Now it's totally common. So I, we see spikes all over the place every day. No one really knows really what's happening. Yeah, the people who do have the information aren't talking. So what, NOCA oil? I, all I can tell you is I've been watching it, and it's been building up, and I hate to say it, up in the Great Lakes area, y'all, are one of, one of, it's kind of the catcher's mitt. And then it'll blow down. Uh, Canada got a lot of the initial North American plume, as far as I can tell. I believe that uh, our geoengineering crew kept the highs and lows and the jet stream position in a certain way to try and run that stuff. But there aren't any borders in the atmosphere. So it's swirling and it's falling and it's creating, there's fizzle events probably happening in the atmosphere. Uh, we don't really, it, you have to wrap your mind around three reactors full of fuel completely in, in, in like unison. So that would be like getting the Rolling Stones the Beatles and the Grateful Dead all playing at the same time on stage, okay? We don't know what that would sound I like. I wasn't expecting that analogy. <laughs> well, who, and then we got, you know, they're still letting Capco run the scene. Isn't there an international body of, like, uh, we're going to put the foot down on you guys. You, you've lost your... You're, we don't trust you to run your operation. If I was running my business like this, I'd be under arrest. And and all the ta taxpayers always bail out the nuke industry in advance, and it's all tied to national security around thermonuclear we weapons developments of the future. And uh, it's it's the completely wrong path. Uh, there's a, co a small college in Vermont yesterday. They don't, none of their money's in oil, and they're saying to everybody, if if your investments are dirty, you're dirty. Please don't invest in companies that are going to destroy the planet's ecology anymore. So this I don't know more movement is what's actually got my attention. Uh -huh. You were telling me Molly about Norway, Paul too. and Saskatchewan, and these resi folks who have it tough, anyways. And the Harper government just uh, changed all the laws on river protection and land protection in Canada, and we went from like eighty thousand rivers protected to eight eighty rivers protected. And they're just coming in, and they're abrogating treaties left and right and uh, there's it's really happening but this I don't know more it's kind of like uh, the virus of Occupy jumped to them because it goes they're viral everybody around the planet I mean they're the the small people George Carlin would tell you in, in five seconds how it works and we pay for it by the way yeah. It's yeah, I love Carlin. We, we played one of his clips on the show and Right. So then they break you and then we take on breaking them on our dime. And with them and that's our last frickin' dime. But we're doing it, aren't we? Yeah, and we bail them out when things go bad. That Price Anderson, you know, the new uh -huh. plant only has to pay like the first what, ten percent? like 10 million and then the tax payers have to pick up the rest if there's a, an accident? Well, everybody's got their asses covered big time except for the small man, you and me. And there's no one sending us any reports or releasing anything. And um, the fact that we could completely change um, parties and presidents and have an avant-garde 
uh, president and have him absolutely continue the same exact uh, foreign covert policies and increase their funding. So the people that people wake up, buy, buy a Geiger counter and learn how to use it. If you all plug into a, a radiation network, then we can all see what's going on in Canada. There's nobody plugged in. I have managed to achieve uh, maybe one person signing up and buying a Geiger counter and getting software and going online and streaming their background every day. But I, I go in and I look at everybody else's and then if I see something that I think you should know about without their permission specifically, and it's already out there publicly, I'm just showing it to people. But yeah, I've, tell us about I have Facebook. alienated many of the older clientele. Tell us about your Facebook page because um, you've become quite a popular guy lately, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We got we got the bump. We got the uh, rad chick bump. We got the nuclear genocide bump. Um, and also, I was almost stopped at the pass that they. Uh, you know, uh, being Buddhist means I can't really do this if uh, there's a whole bunch of people on Radiation Network that are dead set against me doing it. Mm -hmm. I don't understand the why they would policies want the info to be I, san I have carpal tunnel from sanitizing each report. I have to erase everybody's coordinates and station name and just give people the numbers. And uh, really, I'm tired of uh, them cracking jokes at the, those of us who know that we're being inundated. And we, one of the popular things that we do, Christina, is the rain test, okay? Mm -hmm. And we've tried all different kinds of things. And I want to sh shout out to my friend Sammy Paisal down in Brazil. He's a... He He's in posts the chat all the time, EU Dim on YouTube, and Sammy lives where there's a lot of <laughs> normal background. But you, you, from Canada to Brazil, and you know this from your own personal experience, there's nobody you can call up and say, hey, can you check this out? They, they want to know, well, who are you? And, and what are you, a hobbyist? Or, are, you know, wh where's... Do you represent a scientific, you know, community? We, we don't just go check out radiation reports. So there's nobody to call. We don't have a, an ombudsman anymore. And I was hoping our president might be that. No. Mm, ain't going to happen. If it didn't happen the first four years, it ain't probably isn't going to happen now. And... Um, you know, earlier you alluded to the stress of all this. Mm -hmm. And because I left the West Coast when the meltdowns happened, you know, I'm estranged from my partner, and we're burnt out running our page. And now it's taking off. And both of us need rehab and medical care and incomes. But I've been doing it for a year and a half, and I'll continue to do whatever I can. Yeah, can you imagine if we all had, like, money funding to do research? I mean, all of us are doing this with no money. I mean, if you got to come to me to find out what's going on, then the world is, you know, in a world of hurt. And I feel the pain because I'm... <sighs> I go back, you know, this Goffman guy who testified at shutdown and is very famous, Dr. John Goffman, who has now passed away. And he, st he was in on the very first Manhattan proposal discussions when they first w touched out to the scientists. He was one of the guys. He, he, he discovered U uranium-233. Uh, but he eventually became a very vocal opponent, as did Albert Einstein. And he wrote a very famous book about the 
deadly dangers and toxicity of plutonium. And don't kid yourselves, folks. There's kilos of plutonium lost up the stacks of our manufacturing processing facilities right here in our very own country every year. And every decade or so, one of them catches on fire spontaneously. And these are really radical events, and they try to cover them up. And they won't tell you what's going on at Savannah River or Hanford. And all, and all the cleanup crews are being sued and, as they're incompetent. And meanwhile, the rads leak on. So they're up there, and they're hitting us. And, and you, you, your mitigation is the next step. And uh, the courts. But the courts, you could have it all, all your ducks in a row, and the court can just... Uh, you know, look what it took Congress to get uh, this memo, this white memo on the drones. So Congress finally had to haul the Pentagon and said, no, you have to tell us what's going on. But the, the people of America and the people of the world, we turned to our cyber network to find out what's going on these days. A question in chat, Bob wants to know what you think of the soaks, and especially if you use it when grocery shopping. Yeah, this soaks is the perfect pocket model. You don't need a $600 Geiger counter to go shopping. No, and actually soaks makes one, they have an eco tester, uh, you can check potassium levels and things. And it, the, the soaks has great algorithms, and it's the only cylinder model I say, hey, if, you, if that's the only thing you can afford, you can buy one for like under 150 bucks. Yeah. But you can't download it. it. It won't put out a click to your computer, so you can't hook it up to your computer. I know. I was so uh, bummed when I found that out. My friends sit around with a pad of paper and a pencil and watch every minute and write down the numbers so they can create their own graphs, Christina. They do that. Ray sat there for 90 minutes and write down every book. And, but the fact is, so that's a great, yeah, that, like you can take that and hang it, uh, one of our friends hangs it over their car mirror. Because if you drive next to a semi that is putting out 2.58 uh, millisieverts, and, you know, and it's all gamma, you want to know about it. Yeah. You don't want to just sit next to this guy in traffic and not know about it. You're getting irradiated. So I, I have video evidence of this occurring. So if soaks is good, get one, because then you can check all kinds of things. And they read accurately. That's what's important. So And they, they, they have good uh, extrapolation. They, uh, I have a pancake, but, and I can get along with a soaks user. You know, we can talk millisieverts, so we can get along. We get similar readings. So uh, we've, I've learned how to use my inspector and my soaks hand in hand. Mm -hmm. But it's a small model, and it's a, just a personal handheld device. If you call up the EPA and say, look, I'm reading 1,000 millisieverts on my soak, They'll tell you, oh, I'm sorry, we don't consider that. That's not, it's not actually acceptable uh, to the scientific data community. Uh -huh. So that's why I encourage everybody to go to the new, this new Mazer PRM 9000 is a honey. If you're really going to buy a Geiger counter, folks, does histograms, you can get Bluetooth with it, I believe, and uh, it hooks up great. It's clear, it's it's sensitive, but well attenuated. But it's a little over 500, I believe, right now. Um, 
It's a matter of priority, Christina. Debbie, I don't have 500 bucks for one, but um, if you're uh, a relic, if you're a relatively reasonable consumer and you have cable and a cell phone and a computer and all that stuff, I urge you to get a Geiger counter that is has a pancake tube. It'll cost you somewhere between 450 and 550. And then you can get software plug into the net, and if all of us did this, we wouldn't need to worry quite so much. I wanted you to also touch on the importance of the graph that you're posting, because a lot of people are aware of Radiation Network, but they right. just have the dots that update every minute. Right. You're just looking at a one-minute snapshot. So really, if I had a camera I, that I could point at their public site, I could trend everything just by what they publish publicly. Black Cat lets you click on the sites from, and I wish they did that on Radiation Network, but they don't. So that's what makes controversial what I'm doing because I went into the remote data and the, of the other stations, and then I would sanitize the report, and then I would print it on my Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And the ethics of it came down to, we have a need to know, this is an, a radiological crisis, this could be an extinction level event. Right now, I'm, I'm primarily concerned with getting a a realistic picture of what's happening, whether or I'm step, I, I am ready to step on a few toes, and don't believe anyone who tells you that there couldn't possibly be any significant transportation of deadly poisonous uh, spewed out products from these reactors reaching America. Now, on the other hand, this it, we, we're going to be experiencing uh, a growing ground shine, okay? Yeah. And that's the term we're using for when you get a nice coating of cesium in your neighborhood, you get a ground shine. And that's going to be happening all over the place. And then the rains will take it, and the grasses will blow, and then trees will get it, and then we'll have a wildfire. And all the radionuclides from all, this, all the way that we've ever put in the atmosphere in that location can be reintroduced to our biosphere. Well, in the cesium, it's, there's cesium uptake in plants, and Arne Gunderson had reported that uh, the cesium from Fukushima was actually showing up in the pollen Oh, um, yeah, pollen's wicked, especially on the pine trees or those cedar trees. And this was in Southern California. Oh, uh, yeah, well, I used to be partners in a seaweed, a little seaweed company off of Mendocino, this gorgeous sea palm. And I fear for my, part, my old ex-partner because uh, the seaweeds are going to uptake all these things. And these were tremendous healing foods that uh, the indigenous people always relied on in times of famine and start when there wasn't a lot of other food they'd go down and harvest seaweed and uh, we're not going to be able to eat anything pretty soon unless you grow it yourself in some kind of purified environment right and you know I'm I'm actually writing these little short stories that are these scenarios and I would venture that what is actually taking place in our environment outstrips any Hollywood Quentin Tarantino plot by a mile. The conspiracies that unfold behind closed doors every day in almost every facet of our governing agencies, our multinational corporations, uh, we're being, uh, we're, we're the orphans, and we're the test case, 
And our rights are obviously being lined out to us right now as being American isn't special rights anymore. You know, and just because you were white and uh, uh, middle class or upper middle doesn't mean you're secure anymore. And I have kids and grandchildren. So it's what it's all about now. So yeah. get them in the courts. Get, get these people into courts. Well, you know, I, I spent, you know this story, I spent the morning at court yesterday. Yeah. I went with my daughter. She had uh, got a speeding ticket. And two days later, she got pulled over again because she didn't stop pulling out of our sub, even though there's no stop sign and there was no traffic. And the, the harassment that my family has had from the police has mm -hmm. just been unbelievable in the last few months. But anyway, sure. I go to court with her yesterday, and it turns out when she was pulled over two days later, they said her license had been suspended. And that apparently that had occurred the two days prior when she got the speeding ticket, and they have this thing in Michigan now called a um, driver responsibility fee, which used to be if you were convicted of drunk driving, you had to pay this enormous fee to get your license unsuspended. And now yeah. everybody gets that if you're missing any paperwork whatsoever. If you don't have your license on you or your registration or if your plates are expired, you have to pay this enormous fee. And you know, our argument was no one told her her license was suspended for the second ticket because it only happened two days before. And the city attorney was like, I don't have time to go through this paperwork with you. There's 30 people behind you. So we had to get a court appointed a lawyer to, to talk for her. He agreed there was no documentation that supported this whatsoever. So they had to do discovery and put the case off for three more weeks. But we sat there no five way. hours watching people that's what we're paying for christine and i mean even one one of the worst examples i saw was a I, I live across the street from a major university and this kid who was 19 was caught with an open beer and he got uh, six months of drug and alcohol testing 40 yeah. hours of community service and a 700 dollars fine for having one open beer at a party he wasn't driving Ooh. Well, he's lucky that he didn't uh, end up in front of one of those psycho judges that had a contract with those rehab houses and where they'd send 10 times as many kids into these enforced. I mean, you can lose your kid, you know, if you get the wrong judge. This, well, this particular judge pretty much assigned everybody six months of drug and alcohol testing. Um, it, it, oh, yeah. and, and her and the other thing too was like when she gave him community service, she said, you know, you you have to do forty hours of community service to pay society back for the mistake that you made. And I'm thinking, you know, like these corporations get away with murder, That's you know, right. Capco's getting away with murder, and and you know, a kid like this who's like in school and he's working full-time, going to school full-time, there is no way he's going to be able to do any of that. He's being set up for failure. Oh, once it's on your record, too, it's out there for everybody to see forever. And uh, your prospective employers won't have access to this. And, and you can even, uh, you know... It, you can even be well established at work and have something like this happen and it'll go into your work records and uh, it'll follow you around. They want to get you in the system. It's a little easier for them that way. And they make a lot of money off of uh, poor folks. They always have, uh, when they tow your car and impound it, we all know how that it's hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Well, and, and yeah. I, when, when I couldn't afford to register mine, and I, I didn't think in advance to go down and mothball it. So for twenty dollars, I could have told the registry I, I can't afford to drive my vehicle for six months, but I forgot to, so it cost me two hundred and forty dollars. Yeah. Well, that's what they yeah, did to my daughter when they pulled her only over. Only twenty to times what it. You know. Yeah, they they exactly. impounded her car and it was four hundred and fifty dollars for her to get <laughs> exactly. out. Exactly. You can, that's and there's people that make uh, a lot of money because people can't afford to get their cars out. 
So then they lose their car, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, you, know, the, you know, when I, I, the knives and guns that are confiscated get, get sold back into the system. And so, so does the nuclear waste. Uh, you know, it all depends on where you sit. This shit could actually be an asset because uh, if you can get in there and convert it into some kind of uranic hexofluoride, you can get something out of it. So, uh, you know, all the all lost these, them. All these ships that were in Japan for Operation Tomodachi, uh, yeah. they're all highly contaminated. And they're bringing the USS Ronald Reagan back to San Diego in a couple weeks. So there's a total of, what, about nine vessels altogether? There, nine or more. There, there's quite a list. I mean, there were like four destroyers. And, and, and they, you know, TEPCO, work, the people there were so scared, they almost ran. They ran from the plant at one point, I believe. Mm-hmm. We're eva- we had to, I saw our message, we're evacuating the plant. And I go, what, what do you mean you're evacuating? <laughs> so uh, no one, you know, they had, they had their modeling system telling them. And, they, 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 and now they got um, this Abe guy. He, he want, they, everybody wants to go right back to it. They're going to go right back. Even Obama's. Says, yeah, we're going to make some smaller, safer reactors, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Okay, great, sure, everything's fine. But um, I've tried to get away from the pollution in this country, and it's hard, hard to do it. And if we stopped right now, it would take us, all of us, the rest of our lives and lots of cash just to stabilize these places and uh, get some reasonable level of biospheric protection from the leakage of nuclides but uh, they didn't tell us in the beginning that all the plants are going to leak and that's okay and we don't you know but all the plants leak there isn't a plant that doesn't leak there no I really appreciate you coming on here today you know we're <laughs> actually out of time that hour went it, by girl. really fast well it's cause uh, we're a good team I love you very much. Shout out to all my friends in Radiation Watch, RadWatch.info, uh, Marius Paul, and all the people at Idle No More. We love you very, very much. See y'all. We'd like to get you back on a regular basis to share love, caring, and concern for your fellow man. Everyone hang in there and stay safe. Yeah.